we serve. Why don't you take a few moments and greet a few people around you. The Lord bless you. focus on the family and his word searches and all coloring sheets and all kinds of fun stuff. I was, uh, as I was printing them, was tempted to get into that myself. Those puzzles are sort of at my level, so it works very good. Amen. Well, let's just worship the Lord together.
Let's just fill this place with praise and thanksgiving today. What a great Savior. Hallelujah, Jesus. sort of an anthem and uh, it's just a good reminder to me that God is always near even in the midst of, of craziness around us he's the same God who worked mighty wonders in the past and he can do mighty wonders today and if I were to give the time I'm sure we could hear story after story testimony after testimony of how God has worked mightily in our lives. What a blessing it is to serve Him. Hallelujah.
Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We're going to look to the Lord in prayer at this time. We had a special request come in from some people who faithfully watch online from some distance away. And uh, they're at home suffering from COVID this morning. And they just uh, requested that we pray for them. And so we're going to do that, Susan and Jack, this morning. And let's just believe God for big things. Uh, for our, our day camp that's coming up, that God would just bless that, that he would uh, send us a bunch of unsaved kids Amen. so that we can minister to them. And uh, that God would just continue, continue to touch us and bless our church and empower us to reach our community. Let's just bow together in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for your great love and your mercy. We thank you, God, that we can turn to you at any moment. You are a great God. I thank you, Lord, that you stay the same no matter how badly the times change. You never do. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness are always there and your mercies are new every morning. Oh, yes. God, we just pray for Susan and Chad today who are watching online in their homes and they're suffering with COVID. God, if you would just touch them and bring healing to their bodies. We know, Lord, that that continues to, to be an issue and we just pray, God, that you would just protect us and keep us safe. Yeah. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together today to worship you to look into your word i just ask your blessing god and your anointing on me in a few moments as we open your word together and anoint our hearts lord fill us all to overflowing in jesus name amen amen a couple of announcements and then i want to show you a short video uh and I'll introduce that in just a minute. But uh, first, our kitchen coordinator, Susan Foxton, uh, approached me this morning, and uh, she said that they are ready to get our pot blessings going once again on the first Sunday of every month. And uh, so we're going to uh, do that next Sunday. All right? So keep that in mind. It's going to be good. And... Uh, I lost connection with the camera here. Give me a moment. <laughs> there we go. And um, so uh, if you want to help out with that, it's a, it's a pot blessing. So we're relying on people to bring in food. And uh, she, she is in touch with you about uh, which kitchen teams you're on and so on and so forth. Those are good. I, I sure missed those during the time of COVID. It's a great opportunity to get together and to fellowship. So going forward, that will be on the first Sunday of every month, okay? Also, I'm going to invite Marlene to uh, come and share an announcement today. Good morning. I had to write this down, so excuse me if I read it. As you know, we are having the King's Day Camp for a week in August. We're still looking for volunteers, so we ask that we would see Pastor or me, whatever, and uh, so that we could get the volunteers organized. We also, if you think you're too old to help, you're never too old. And, and I'm sure that we can find something for you to do at your pace. Like if you don't like being with the kids, we can still find something for you to do. We also have the plan to protect and police checks that have to be done beforehand. Thank you for the people who have already handed them in. There's still a good number who haven't handed them in. For those who have and haven't yet, we need to see two pieces of identification that we can photocopy and send in with your application. And now we're getting down to the crunch. As police are busy too, and they also need to get them back to get them back in time, we need to get them in right away. So please, on Tuesday, bring in your application and identification, and we'll get everything signed and photocopied and sent away. 
For those who work through the day, and well, I'll be here at the office from 5 until 7 on Tuesday evening to get your application signed and photocopy. You can also do them online, and if you have problems with them, um, please let Pastor Jason or myself know and we can help you. So I really encourage you to come in on Tuesday in the daytime or late afternoon and get your applications finished so we can get them sent away this week. We'll see you all on Tuesday. Thank you, Marlene. Yesterday we had a great event here, uh, Touch Truck, Touch a Toy, and I was surprised at the number of vehicles that were here. And uh, they just kept rolling in, and there were some really cool trucks here, and some really cool cars. And uh, you know, as a guy uh, who enjoys that type of thing, it was uh, it was nice. Uh, we were able to uh, put together three rather large boxes of food for the uh, North Huron Food Bank, as well as a number of uh, monetary donations that came in. And I'll be taking all of that to the food bank tomorrow. And I want to thank uh, everybody that participated. I want to thank my friend uh, Jamie Fisher, a local realtor who helped me to organize this event. And uh, he really, he wants to make this an annual thing. And he, he talked about installing a pad out there to do spin outs and a jump in the middle of the soccer field and stuff like that. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I put together a, a, a little bit of a slideshow of pictures that we took yesterday. We'll put those on the screen and then uh, we'll look into the word together. Thank you. 
That was a lot of fun yesterday, so thank you to everybody who came and took part in that. I also want to thank my good buddy Dan McCauley for uh, letting me use his song this morning. We've had him here before, and I'll try to get him back here sometime. Uh, again, Dan's a great guy. He's hilarious, um, and he's a good Bible teacher, and it would be a lot of fun. So thank you, Dan. All right, if you have your Bible with you, I'm going to invite you, please, to go to Luke's Gospel, Chapter 5. Luke's Gospel, Chapter 5. And today we're starting a brand new series. Our focus for uh, some of the summer months anyway, how God turns setbacks into comebacks. Maybe you can go back to the title slide there for a few minutes, Andrew. You know, we live on a broken planet. You know this to be true. Because of that, everybody has problems. All right? Anybody here never have problems? And everybody has trials. Everybody has difficulties. We all experience loss and failures, mistakes, and setbacks. And there's all kinds of setbacks. Maybe you're listening to me right now. And you're going through a setback as we speak. Maybe it's a financial setback or uh, a health setback or a career setback, a relationship setback, a setback in your marriage, or even a setback in your plans or your dream. We have all kinds of setbacks through our lives. And so during this series, we're going to look at how God helped people in the Bible overcome these common kinds of setbacks that we experience in life. It's amazing. The Bible is thousands of years old, but it's just as relevant today as it ever was. Now, we're going to start today by looking at what we do when we've had a setback at work. All right. And this is going to apply to everybody. All right. But maybe you've had a business setback or a work setback. Or uh, perhaps you've gone through a bankruptcy. Even if you think this doesn't apply to you, you're going to draw some principles from this story in Luke chapter 5 today. That's going to help you in your walk with Christ. This is a story of some professional fishermen who were failing miserably in their fishing business until they turned to Jesus. Now, I love fishing. I don't get to go fishing too often. But when I was younger, I, I used to fish a lot. It was wonderful. It brought me a lot of peace. Now, if you've been around fishermen, you know that fishermen have stories. And uh, the more they tell these stories, the bigger the fish get. I mean, I once caught a monster. This, uh, never caught one that big. All right. So we're going to look at a story today that is, I think, the greatest fishing story of all time. This one's true. If you've ever felt discouraged by your work, by your career, by your job, if you ever felt like you're not getting anything accomplished, even if you poured your blood, sweat, and tears into it, you picked a good Sunday to come to church. Because this miracle in this story gives us lessons that we need when we have a work setback. It's in Luke chapter 5. It's interesting, this is the second, uh, second miracle of Jesus his first miracle was uh, turning water into wine at the wedding in Cana. So this is early on in his ministry. And it's at this miracle where he calls his first four disciples to follow him. I want to give you a little background here. Peter and Andrew were brothers. And James and John were brothers. And these four guys had a fishing business together in northern Israel close to the Sea of Galilee. So you're going to see that um, when you in your Bible reading in the New Testament, the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Gennesaret, it's all the same thing. 
for our purposes, we'll call it the Sea of Galilee. It's actually a lake, all right? In Luke 5, they've been out fishing all night. They caught nothing. That, that means that they worked all of those hours for absolutely no profit at all. And they come ashore in the morning, and they're cleaning their nets, and they're tired, and they're discouraged because they have no fish. Now Jesus comes along, and he's talking to a crowd. There's a crowd of people right there on the shore. And so he goes up to, to them, and he asks these guys if he could use one of their boats as a platform to speak from and so this is where we pick up the story. Luke chapter 5, first three verses. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Now, why did Jesus ask to, uh, to, to borrow the boat? There's a, there's a few different reasons. First, uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but water amplifies your voice. Uh, your voice goes further on the water than it does on the land uh, because the ground absorbs sound waves. So my wife is watching. If, if you think that I'm not listening, it's because the, the ground in our home is absorbing the sound waves. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, honey. She's uh, she's not here today because uh, our 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 little guy Nathaniel forgot what it meant to sleep last night, and so he was up pretty much all night. But more importantly, Jesus uh, he's about to choose these four guys as his first disciples, and he's going to ask them to do something very very big. He's going to ask them to leave their business and follow him. He's planning to do a miracle in their work, a miracle that they would understand. Verse 4, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the, net, the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. This is his livelihood, okay? Jesus, we've worked hard all night. We haven't made a sale. And we put all those hours in and we're getting nothing in return, Jesus. We haven't closed the deal. The deal. Uh, I'm, I'm out of work right now, Lord. I, I can't get ahead. And you can hear the discouragement in Peter's voice. You know, sometimes this happens in life. You give it your best shot. You come up short. Sometimes you work diligently and there's nothing to show for it. And if that's you, you have a setback. Sometimes you just hang in there with your marriage and you, you struggle. And maybe you get counsel and you read books on it and you really try to make it work, but you don't see any improvement at all. The fact is this, that the miracle this miracle of Jesus has a lot to teach us about setbacks. And, and here's the truth. Everybody's fishing for something. Sometimes we're fishing for approval. Sometimes we're fishing for security. Sometimes uh, we're fishing for significance. Or maybe you're fishing for a spouse. Or a significant relationship. Well, what are you fishing for? When these four guys do what Jesus tells them to do, they not only receive a miracle, but they're blessed more than, than, than they can handle themselves. They actually have to share their blessing with other people. And their lives are changed forever. Jesus uses Peter's boat as a platform to preach the good news. Now after Jesus had, had uh, finished speaking to Peter, go out where it is deeper, let down your nets for a catch. Verse 5, Peter says this, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. 
And so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. I tell you something, folks. Nobody's ever going to be able to top that fish story. That was a miracle. This is the point. They caught more in 10 minutes than they had in 10 hours because they did it the way Jesus told them to do it. And this is how setbacks are turned to comebacks. It's called the miracle of acceleration. God speeds up the process. They caught a lot of fish in a very short amount of time. And when you understand this miracle, you're not going to worry about timing anymore. You might go without for a little while, but it doesn't matter because God can speed up the process and fill your life with everything that you need and so much more. And he can do more in 10 minutes than we can do in 10 years if we do it the way he tells us to do it. I want to go through four things this morning, four things that we need to do if we're experiencing a setback in our work. Number one, I need to give Jesus complete access to my boat. Now the boat here represents our work. Give Jesus complete access to my work. If I want to go from emptiness to overflowing, I have to give Jesus complete access to my boat. Verse 3 tells us Jesus got into one of the boats. So if you want God's blessing in your work, you got to let him in the boat. Now notice in this story, it's the same boat, it's the same nets, it's the same fishermen, it's the same lake. The only difference from catching nothing to overflowing abundance is that Jesus is in the boat. And that's the game changer. You have to give Jesus access to your job, your career, or your business. These guys aren't out fishing by themselves anymore. They've got God with them. Now I want to apply this. Your boat is how you make your living, your means of support. Simon Peter uh, was a fisherman. His boat is his business. And so in essence, he's giving Jesus his job. What's your boat? What does it mean to have Jesus in your boat? It means you dedicate your job your career, and your business to the Lord. I'm not talking about salvation here. You can have Jesus in your life, but not in your boat. Are you letting Jesus use your job as a platform for ministry and mission? When Peter let Jesus into his boat, he got blessed with incredible results. Now, we normally think that God makes me successful in business, so then I'll serve God with my success. Wrong. In fact, it's the exact opposite. God often uses my job or even my lack of it now and then so that success can come. But there's no comeback without a setback first. The setback is part of the plan. Peter's fished all night, he caught nothing. How's he going to go from nothing to abundance? Well, Peter lets Jesus use his boat as a platform. Jesus got to use Peter's source of income as a platform to speak to other people. And maybe you're here today, you've had a setback in your job. Give your job as a platform to Jesus to spread the good news to other people, and then God can bless your work. Now, let me ask you this. What do you want God to bless in your life? I want you to listen carefully here. Whatever you want God to bless in your life, you put him first in that area. You want God to bless your time? Give God the first part of every day for prayer and devotion and honor him with that and he'll bless your time. 
You give God the first part of your week to honor his Sabbath day. And you do no work on that day. And God will bless your work. Do you want God to bless your money? You give him the first part of your income. It's called a tithe. And you get Jesus in your work. Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek first God's kingdom and what God wants. And then all your other needs will be met as well. So if you set about your work as a means to just make money and, and meet your needs, that, that's the wrong focus. Your work needs to be a platform for God's glory. You put him first in that, and he'll bless your work. Notice what it says. It says, seek God's kingdom first. You seek what God wants first. And then all the other needs are met by him. You let him use your job as a platform to spread the good news, and then you let God take control. You know what happens? Your work then becomes a ministry. Because you put Jesus first in your job, you're a missionary there. You're here today and you're a realtor. You put Jesus first in your realty. You're a missionary disguised as a realtor. Or I'm a missionary disguised as a carpenter. I'm a missionary disguised as a teacher. I'm a missionary disguised as a truck driver. You first and foremost use your work as a platform for Jesus and you watch what he will do in your life. Some of you may be going through some tough times right now and you're trying to change everything. These guys who went fishing all night caught nothing. They didn't need to change their nets or their boat or anything else for that matter. They didn't have to put on their lucky fishing lure. They didn't have to, to uh, douse their lures with Berkeley's musky scent. <laughs> they just needed to get Jesus in charge of the boat. All right, secondly, I admit that my efforts are not working. I have to admit that my efforts are not working. In verse 5, Peter says this, Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. Now, do you realize how hard it was for Peter to say that? Listen, he's a professional fisherman. He's good at what he does. Fishing was his livelihood. However, sometimes when you're a pro, you fish all night and you catch nothing. Even when you're experienced at your job, fish all night and catch nothing. It's humbling to say this. You know, for Peter to not catch fish would be like uh, like uh, Pascal Siakam playing an entire game for the Raptors without scoring one basket. It's unheard of. Sometimes our best just isn't good enough and sometimes our situations are out of control. Listen, economy is in tough times right now. Don't worry about it. You can't control it. God can. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And guess what? Our Heavenly Father's loaded. And even in tough times, we can trust Him. You can't control the economy. You can't control the weather. Okay? There's only one person that's in charge of the weather, and his name is God. There's a lot of things that we can't control that will affect our, affect our jobs and our lives. You can't control other people. You can't control viruses and diseases. You can't control the aging process. No matter how much Botox injections we get, or how many plastic surgeries we have, it doesn't change the fact that we're getting older. Remember, Years ago, I was watching the, the Oscars, and Johnny Carson was the host. 
And uh, he said, I look around tonight and I see lots of old faces and I see lots of new faces. And I see lots of new faces on the old faces. <laughs> you know, most of the major things in our lives we can't control. What do we need to do? You get Jesus in your boat and you admit that your way isn't working. And we don't want to admit our way isn't working because it hurts our pride. We're human beings and we're very, very stubborn. And we're afraid of what people might think of us. So here's the third thing, the third step the disciples took. And here's where it starts to turn around. I do whatever Jesus tells me to do. I got, I got him in the boat. I admit that my way hasn't been working. And then I do whatever he tells me to do. I need to be willing to obey Jesus Christ. Even if it doesn't make sense. And it might appear stupid to other people, but I obey everything Jesus tells me to do. Now look at Simon Peter. Simon answered, Master, we work hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. We need to become because you say so people. I obey Jesus if it doesn't even if it doesn't make sense to me or to anybody else. It didn't make sense to Peter, but he did it anyway. That's, that's the third key to this miracle. Trust the word of God. Not only is Jesus in the boat, he's, he's giving the fishing instructions. And notice what Peter does not do. He doesn't argue with Jesus. He never told Jesus, you carpenter, me fisherman. You know wood, I know fish. He didn't say to Jesus, I've been out fishing all night and they ain't biting. He never got arrogant about his career. When Jesus told him to launch out again, he does it. By the way, it's a very good idea for you to obey Jesus like that. <laughs> because you say so Lord I will do it now remember at this point Peter's not a disciple this is his first experience with Jesus God will bless your life if you obey him 1 Kings 2 verse 3 obey the laws of God and follow all his ways keep each of his commands you will prosper in everything you do wherever you turn question what has God told you to do that you're not doing don't put it off any longer jump into your obedience of him when you become an obedient person to God God is going to give you a vision for your career and your life like you've never seen And it will always come in three phases. It's going to involve when, what, and where. Jesus told, told Peter, launch out now. That's the when. And launching out always uh, involves taking a risk. Now listen, God wants you to grow in your faith. There's no faith without risk. We're launching out in faith to do a day camp for the kids in our community. I have no idea how many kids are gonna come. I'm believing God for a hundred. And I would love to see more. But I'm leaving that up to God. But we need help. And maybe you're feeling God tugging on your heart to help out in this. Don't question it. Say yes to Jesus. God wants you to grow in faith. There's no faith without a risk. Hebrews 11 verse 6, no one can please God without faith. 
Jesus told Peter, let down your nets. That's, that's the what. And where? Jesus told Peter to go to the deeper water. Why did God tell Jesus to go, or tell Peter to go to the deeper water? Because that's where the big fish were. Listen, most people live their lives in the shallows of life. And many Christian people live their lives this way. And they're afraid to go a little bit deeper because it's safer in the shallow water. But a lot of the reasons why God allows setbacks into our lives is to force us to go into deeper water where we need to exercise our faith and trust him. He loves you too much to let you stay in the shallow water. We stay in the shallows of life. We don't grow. God wants you to grow. If you want to grow, then you get ready for God to put you into deeper waters where it's uncomfortable. And sometimes you'll have to tread water. But you trust him. And then here's the fourth thing. You need to expect Jesus to turn things around. I heard this from a, from a preacher years and years ago, Francis Armstrong from Kingston. He said, the atmosphere of expectancy is the breeding ground of miracles. So in other words, if we're not expecting Jesus to do big things, let's not be surprised if they don't happen. <clears throat> But could you imagine if we all came together expecting God to do big things? We have that attitude of expectancy. I'll tell you, the stuff that would take place, it would change people's lives. We'd never be the same. Now follow me on this. If God tells you to go fishing and God comes along with you in the boat and God points out to you where you should let down your nets, do you, do you think you're going to come up empty? I truly believe at this point, Peter was expecting a catch. Maybe he didn't know how big it was going to be, but I think he was maybe a little bit excited. Why? Well, he's got Jesus in his job, and he's doing what Jesus has told him to do. With God's plan in his mind and God's promise in his heart, there's no way he is not going to succeed. If God can control the forces of nature, which of course he can, he was able to command all the fish in the Sea of Galilee to come to that one spot in the deep water. Jesus can get you what you need. Jesus can take care of you, but you got to do it his way. He can do it just like that, but you got to trust him. Luke 5, 6, and 7. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When they had let Jesus into their boat and admitted that their way didn't work, and they did what he told them to do, they expected the results, and boy, did they ever get it. They had so many nets, that or so many fish that their nets were starting to break. And they actually had to call their partners from the other boat to come and help them. And they filled both boats with fish and their boats began to sink. They couldn't handle the blessing that Jesus gave them. So they had to share it so that their boats wouldn't sink. God is looking for people to bless. And he'll bless your socks off if you do these four things that we talked about today. A lot of people are worried about the economy right, right now, but you don't have to worry because God owns this planet. And if you put Jesus first in your job, and you let him use your job as a platform to share good news, and you admit that your way hasn't been working, and you start doing it the way Jesus wants, and you expect the blessing to come, 
He will sustain you with incredible blessings even in the midst of this harsh economy when everything is so crazy expensive. And you know what? God wants to show his power. He wants to show the world that he is God. And he wants to do it through you and me. And that's when God gets the glory. And notice Peter's reaction, verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Remember, he's not a disciple yet. He's a fisherman. Verse 9, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish he had taken. And so were James and John, the son of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Now, this miracle is the turning point in the lives of these four men. The point of all that was this. Verse 10, and Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. This miracle was not really about money or possessions. It was about finding God's purpose for their lives. And that's the takeaway from this. It's not about my job or my income. It's about the kingdom of God. Jesus is getting ready to, to call these guys to follow him 100%. He did this miracle to teach these guys how to be used by God to change people's lives. The huge number of fish caught here represents the huge number of people that be, would be won for the kingdom of God through these men. And Jesus showed them through this miracle what he can do if they put him first. Through this miracle, he called them to drop everything, to follow him. What did they do? Verse 11, they pulled their boats up on shore and left everything and followed him. You know, you know what that means? Those two boatloads of stinking fish, all their gear, they left it on the shore and they followed Jesus. This is the point I want you to get when you're wanting to move from a setback to a comeback. They were willing to follow Jesus. They were willing to leave the blessing behind because at this point, they were more interested in the blesser than in the blessing. You, you get that this morning? They, they saw the blessing. They saw that huge number of fish. It was unreal. That number of fish would have sustained them for a long time. You think of the money they could have made. But at that point, they were just so astonished by Jesus. They left it all behind. And they just followed him. They were more interested in the blesser than the blessing. I have to ask this question. Are you? Am I? Are you more interested in God blessing you? Or are you more interested in following the blesser? I think that's the point where God wants to get us to. That our interest in following Jesus wherever he would lead us is more important to us than the blessing. They could have taken this blessing and moved on with their lives, but the bigger blessing was following Jesus. This was Peter's first encounter with Jesus. You know what happened with Peter? In Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, under the power of the Holy Spirit, he stood up and he preached the gospel. 3,000 people were won into the kingdom of God that day. Man, who knows 
what God can do through you and me when we say yes to Jesus and we follow him. We can change the world. What is God calling you to do? Let's bow. Maybe you're here today, you don't know, or you're watching online, you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's the most important decision that anybody could ever make. I would love for you to make that decision today. All of us are sinners. The Bible says in the book of Romans, we all have fallen, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It also says in the book of Romans that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. How do we get this eternal life? Romans also teaches in Romans 10 verses 9 and 10, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I will be saved. And John 3 16 says, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life, for God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him would be saved. He loves you so much. You say yes to Jesus today. Just pray a little prayer like this. Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. I've been doing it my way my whole life, and I've failed. Today, I invite you into my life. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of my sins. Today, for the first time, I say that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I believe that he died on the cross to save me from my sins. And that he rose again to seal that victory. Today I turn my back on my way of doing things. And I follow you. Please save me, Lord. In Jesus' name. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe you're here today. You've been walking through a setback. Maybe in your job, your career relationship, whatever. You're going to learn over these next weeks how God turns those into comebacks. Listen, God is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? If you're here today, you're walking through a setback just by raising your hand and saying, Pastor J, please pray for me. Is that you? Yes. Are there any more? Yes. Yes. All of them. Yes. Yes. Father God, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would give all of us the strength to get you into our boat. To stop relying on our own way of doing things. To do it your way. Help us, God. I pray for these dear people. Lord, that they would experience your blessing and that you would turn their setbacks into comebacks. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. I thank you for this church, for this amazing congregation. God, please bless them. May they walk in your love and your peace, your grace. Father, bless our time of fellowship in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, folks. Take care.